Welcome to the Kingsway Christian Fellowship Sermon Podcast. We are streaming live from Karam Downs in Melbourne, Australia. Kingsway Christian Fellowship is a non-denominational, Bible-believing, and preaching church. We believe the Bible is the inherent Word of God and preach it verse by verse. You can follow us at www.kingswaycf.com and follow our video sermons. Now, join us as we listen to the latest sermon preached by Pastor John Shipman. So I ask again, are you here for the Word of the Lord this morning? Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to disappoint you, just the Word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is so powerful and it's so needed. We're going to go back to Acts chapter 4 this morning. And I want to talk to you about how faith is proved. How faith is proved. And let me just say right at the start that you cannot uh, prove faith without testing. Your faith needs to be tested so that you know that your faith is proven. This is what it's all about. We're going to go back into the book of Acts. We, we know by now that uh, Peter and John came to the temple. They walked up. There was this crippled man there, this lame man there. Peter walked up to this man. He said, silver or gold, that I have not. But what I have is he, he raised him up. He says, walk in the name of Jesus. This man started leaping and, and jumping and he was so glad. He grabbed onto Peter like a koala bear. You remember that? The Bible says that he grabbed onto him so strongly. And that made a commotion there that the people started running to see. You know what people are? We're all just curious, aren't we? You see a commotion, it's like a, it's like a moth with a flame. You can't but go closer to it, isn't it? You know, just drive down the Monash. You're on this lane, there's an accident on the other lane. And, and I don't understand why this lane slows down. It is because we are all rubberneckers. Everybody wants to see what's going on there. Can I just see? Can I see the person lying on the wing? Is, isn't that true? And the same happened here. Everybody ran together to that area. And there Peter preached one of the greatest sermons that you can find. A sermon that he preached the gospel. We still need to preach the gospel in the world. And the Bible says 5,000 men came and, and, and were saved that day. Wow, what a sermon. What a sermon. And today they run after people who's Ill equivalent, you know, they speak like angels. But this man just came out and he gave the gospel and 5,000 people got saved. And we're going to now use the next part of that passage to teach and to learn how our faith is proven. How can we prove our faith? But before we get into that, I want to also use this opportunity to go back to last week. You remember we spoke about the will of God last week. Who remembers that? You should remember that because I gave you, uh, I said to you, there's a challenge. I said to you the first, there's five words that we need to remember. The first word is what? Meditate. Meditate. Did you go and meditate this week? Did you soak in the word? That's what it means. You need to sort of soak in the scriptures. How do you do that? By reading it day and night. Day and night. You know, I'm reading the Bible. I read it because I prepare and I read a lot and I listen a lot. But I took the challenge on as well. I said, Lord, apart from my Bible study that I do to come and preach your word here, apart from that, I'm again going to take up this challenge for this month and for going forward to keep on reading extra. And what a blessing. What a blessing. Already this morning I'm feeling blessed. Are you feeling blessed? Soak in the scriptures. Please, please, brother, sister, don't come to me and say, but preacher, but pastor, I don't have time. I don't have time. Because when you run out of time, that's when you're going to go to the one who gives you time and ask for time. No, no, don't come to me and say, no, there's no time or my lifestyle is too busy. Maybe that's the problem. No, no, soak in the scriptures, meditate. If you want to come into the will of God, that's where you're going to find it. Why am I going back here? Because we see in Peter and John and James and all the apostles' lives, how they, they meditated in the word. Go and look at Peter. Whenever they come to him, what does he do? He gives them scriptures. Isn't it right? He quotes the scriptures. He don't tell them stories. He don't tell them fables. He says it is written. He quotes the scriptures. How can he, how can a man, how can a fisherman, how can a man which you will see in the Bible soon, 
who's got no education in the scriptures, come out and, and talk scriptures just flowing out of its heart. Just flowing out. How? Yes. You, it can't come out if it didn't go in. Isn't that right? But some people are walking today in garbage in, garbage out. They fill them so much with garbage that there's no place. There's no place for the word of God. Let it be known that the child of God should be known, should be known by the word of God. Yes? You should be so filled that you overflow, that people talk to you, that scriptures comes out. When people come to you and they say, my life is in shadows, I'm, I'm in trouble. And, and how can you help me? Well, I can't help you, but Jesus can. And, and I'll tell you one thing, I, I'm telling you this today. Scriptures will start filling your mind. And all you do to that person, you speak scriptures into their lives. Because the word of God is alive. The Word of God is living. That's what the Bible says. He, he declares it Himself. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is living. Everybody say living. It's not dead. It's not moldy old pages. It's not. Show me your Bible. Show me. If your Bible falls apart, your life will be healed. But if your Bible you know, gathers dust and it's in a, in a pristine condition, then maybe your life is not where it should be. Well, I got that off my chest. But... <laughs> But we need to meditate in the Word. We need to soak in the Word. Peter soaked in the Word. John soaked in the Word. And now we read about it. Yes. And then we continue on. Dedicate. These men dedicated themselves to God. They gave their bodies as a living sacrifice. They didn't care what people think about them. Not a don't care uh, uh, attitude. Don't get me wrong here. But when they came out and say, I stand for Christ, I'm going to preach Christ. They could have taken their lives, they could have taken their, their homes, they could have taken their cars, they could have taken their money. No, no, it didn't matter to them. And you will see that, you're going to see it happen today. Dedicate, that's the next thing if you want to be in the will of God. You need to absolutely submit and sacrifice to Him. And then you investigate, you investigate. Why, why do you investigate? You're going to do something. You start praying about it, then, then you start looking at obstacles and you talk to the Lord about it. We moved from South Africa 25, 26 years ago. I know I'm in the perfect will of God where I'm standing right here in Melbourne, Australia in 2022 in August. This man knows I'm standing in the will of God here today. I know this. How do you know this pastor? How do you know this preacher? Because when I moved from South Africa, I just didn't pick up and go. I wasn't running away from violence in the country. I wasn't holed up in these terrible stories. But I can take you to the scripture verse in the Bible where the Lord gave me a scripture to go to New Zealand. He followed it up with His word. I was soaking the word. I was praying for weeks on end. And then I investigated. Then I went to, to, to old saints, you know, pastors. And, and I went to old brothers who's been in the faith for long. And I discussed it with them. They were concerned. They were concerned. And how about moving from New Zealand to Australia? What am I doing here? We had a church there. We were pioneering a church there. I had a great job. I've had a great church there. But then again, brothers and sisters, I soaked in the word and I read until I came into the book of Acts and the Lord gave me scripture to confirm his will in my life. I'm not here by chance. I'm not standing here because I, I want to stand here. I'm standing here because I believe I'm sent by God to stand here. How is your life? You see, you need to investigate and then you eliminate. If you want to walk in the will of God, you can't walk in the will of God if there's still sin in your life. If there's still sin in your life, your sin will destroy your life. Let me be clear about that. I can't stand here and tell you because I like you, it's going to be okay. But if there is sin in your life, know it today from this preacher, that sin is going to destroy your life. You're going to grow old if God spares your life before He takes you away. You're going to grow old and you're going to be a wretched old man or woman with sin drenched all over your life. And let it be known, let it be known, you will walk in the past for the rest of your life until you die. I've seen this with my own two eyes of people who walk in that. No, no, you need to eliminate, get rid of sin, get rid of it. These men that we're talking about did that and then you initiate, you do it. That's what these men did. The Lord called them. 
Come, Peter. Come, John. Peter was a fisherman. Yeah. That was so good. He was in his job. He was in his prime. He, he had a good business. He was catching the fish. And while he was catching the fish, the Lord Jesus came past and he said, follow me. He let his nets go and he followed him. What did you leave behind when he called you? You see, when you want to follow Christ, it's going to cost you a price. You know what price it's going to cost you? It's going to cost you your life. Because he gave his life, he's asking of you to follow him to give your life. That which is important to you, you need to give to him. There's no other way. There's no more roads that lead to Rome. There's only one way and that's Jesus Christ. And he gave his life for you. So the, the least he wants for you is to give your life to him. Oh, but John, John was a lovely man, isn't it? The disciple... The loving disciple of the Lord. The one who was leaning against his breast at the last table. You know, this man was sitting there and he was mending his nets. You remember that? Go read it in the Bible. He wasn't, ca he wasn't busy casting. He was mending the net. And that's when the Lord came to him and said, follow me, follow me. And here is these two men. They went through these five words. And they dedicated themselves. And where do they find them now? In the perfect will and place where God wants them to be. They are right now. They've just helped a man by the name of Jesus Christ. They're standing in there, in the temple, and what do they do? They preach the word of God. Yes? So how do we come now and understand? Because we're going to learn a lesson today. We're going to look quickly at their life story, what's happened now, and then we're going to go to James, and we're going to apply the word of God. Scripture interprets Scripture. Acts chapter 4 verse 1. Now as they spoke to the people, this is uh, Peter and John, the priests, the captains of the temple, this is the police of the day, the police of the temple, okay, the captain of the temple, and the sad you sees came upon them. I love this name, sad you see. They were sad you see. <laughs> Why were they sad you see? Because these people didn't believe in angels. These people didn't believe in life after death. These people believe, and there are a lot of people in the world, there's even Christians who believe this. They believe that when you die, that's it. Kaput, morgen troche. Okay, that's a South African phrase, okay? It is done, you're done, you're finished. And that is sad, you see, to be, to be, be like that. So I think it's a good name for them, isn't it? You know, it's just good to know you. It's sad, you see. But these sad, you see, were there. They came together with the priest, with the captain. And being greatly disturbed. This is where the trouble starts now. That they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. This is why these people were so unhappy. Because they were preaching Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They did not believe in that. And from here on you're going to see these people be playing a big part in persecution. And they laid hands on them. Now, let it not be romantically. They didn't come around and just come around them and took them. If it says they laid hands on them, it means that they grabbed them with intimidation. Now, now I want you to place yourself in this position constantly and, and think of yourself, what, how would you have reacted if you were Peter? Think of that. You know your character today. You know when somebody says something about you which you don't like, how you react. What do you do? Some people go straight into the fight mode. How can you say that about me? And some people go into the flight mode. They run away. So put yourself in that position. That's how you read the Bible. Because the Bible is the mirror of God. Who knows that? You measure you up against what you hear today. These men came over and they intimidated. They, they lay hands on them. They grabbed them with, with power. How would you react? Would there be a few fist punches going in there? A few swear words? And put them into custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So what have these guys done wrong? All of a sudden they've been violently taken and put into, they can't, they're not free anymore. I mean, we get locked down and you sit in your house and people complain about it. These men were put in custody. This is persecution. Things aren't going well here. 
In verse 4, however, many of those who heard the word believe. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody shout praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. There is fruit in the preaching of the word. Hallelujah. You can shout hallelujah again. Let me say that again. There is fruit in preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. And this is, man, if you want to, look, look, if the Lord calls you into ministry and, and you want to do just one thing, preach the gospel, there's fruit in that. There were 5,000, the number of the men came to about 5,000. I said it last time, it says the men. So we know that there were men and women. And, and there's another thing about this. If a man came to the Lord, the chances are 80% that his whole family gets saved. It's upside down in our world today. You can go into any church, you will see more women in the church than men. There's something wrong. You go into the world now, the most dangerous person in the world is men according to the world. Why do you think this? Because Satan, Lucifer, no. If the men comes to Christ, there's a massive movement of God. And, and it's not taking away from the sisters. Don't, don't understand me wrong here. But he comes here and he says there were so many men, 5,000, and he came to pass on the next day that they rulers. Now look at this. This is a really impressive group of people. The elders and the scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest. Wow, he was in town. Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. This is very intimidating. And there's a reason why he writes these names down. This is like the high brass of the leadership comes together. Here is these two men in, in captivity. They've been held on. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, can you, can you feel the intimidation, the persecution coming on? They asked this question, which is really a great question. You know, I wonder if they thought what they asked. They say, by what power or by what name have you done this? There's a reason why they ask this. They say power and name. You say by what power and by what name? Or by what name have you done this? Because in, in the Jewish tradition and, and biblical times, the name represents the character of the person. And the character of the person represents the name of a person. I love it. So many times when I preach out of the Old Testament, we look at the name and the meaning of the name, and it explains the character, and you combine what happens around it. So by what power is this? And by what name are you doing this? And then I love this, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders. They asked the question, and what is the logical answer? By what power? We remember what Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. What did he say? You shall receive dunamis. You remember that word? You will receive power. Dunamis power. When what happens? When will you receive this power? When? The Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. That word there in Greek is martyr. Martyr means you die for what you believe in. You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. Remember, these men are still in Jerusalem. Remember, they were still just preaching to Jews. No Gentiles yet. This is still where they're preaching to Jews. I'm going to show you as we continue through how this is a transitional book and the message changes, but the gospel stays the same. By what power? Well, these men were full of the dunamis power from the Holy Spirit. I love it. He says, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so many times we see people try to do things without the Holy Spirit. If we this day, Peter says, judge for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Jerusalem and Israel that I, Peter, am now going to open up the Peter Ministries. Is that what he said? He had all the reason now to go out into the public and go, this is the Peter ministries or the Peter and John ministries. No, no. He operates in the power of God and he says to them that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You see, he points everybody towards Christ. 
What you should do if people come to you is point them to Christ. He is the one who has the power. He says in that name, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man is standing before you. He plays again on their guilt. He says, you are guilty of crucifying the Prince of Life. That's you. Already he's back into his mold of preaching the gospel again. Have you noticed? And let it be known, he was preaching out there to that 5,000 plus people. But when he was standing in the point of intimidation, what did he do? He goes back to the gospel. He says, I'm not intimidated to you with you guys. Anas, the high priest, you guys are standing there. Everybody walks past and go, whoa, there's Anas. You know, you are the type of people, if they take a photo, everybody wants to stand next to you to be in the photo. You are so important. This is no importance for him. He goes, I am going to preach to you the gospel. For let it be known the gospel saves everybody. Everybody, if you preach it to them. In verse 11 he says, that this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, the gospel. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. And if that's not underlined in your Bible, underline it. There is no other name. Everybody say no. no. Or maybe no. Perhaps no. By chance, no. There is no other name but the name of Jesus Christ under heaven, given among men by which we must be saved. Not by you, Annas. Not by you, scribes. I know you are upholding the law, Sadducees. I can see that you are sad today and I can see that, but not even anything you give us. There's only one name and that's the name of Jesus Christ. You know, Philippians chapter 2, he says, Therefore God also has highly exalted Him, that name, and given Him the name which is above every name. My friends, let me just tell you. You know, I, I, I believe I still got strength in my body. When I was younger, I was playing rugby and I look around me and I look at a strong man and I think, I can take him on. You know, I can get the ball on my hands and I can run over that man. I used to feel like that and I used to try that. Today I'm sitting with all the pain, yes? But you know, then there was a stronger than, a guy than me and he ran over me. And when I look around me, there is stronger people than me. There is somebody more cleverer than me. But when God sits on His throne and He looks around, there is nobody. There ain't nobody on His level. And it's not that we can pull him down. He came down himself to our level. It is so wonderful. There is no other name. In verse 10 in Philippians 2 he says, That at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and the Father. Do you believe in that scripture verse? Now he says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. That's always where it goes to, isn't it? They marveled. Wow! How can these men speak so freely? Now when it says untrained and uneducated, it doesn't mean that they were dumb. Okay? It just means that they were not trained under a teacher, under a rabbi. They were not trained. You see, in the Jewish tradition what happens, you work in your trade. You grow up until you're 12 years old. Then you have your bar mitzvah. You become a man. And when you become a man, that's when the rabbis walk around. And those young children who studied the Torah very diligently, those who were really the cream of the crop, you could say, they were really academically well placed. The rabbis will go around and they will pick these youngsters. And they will go into the temple and become the students of these rabbis. But what happened to the rest? Well, when you become 12 years old, you go into your trade. You become a man. And these young boys would have become fishermen. So they stopped studying further in the Torah. They stopped studying further into the prophets, into the law. 
But while these others were going to the university, to the Pharisee university, and become more clever, these boys were growing up. So they knew the Torah, they knew the scriptures. I mean, Peter was quoting it. But what it means here, according to them, they were untrained in the law. They were uneducated. They say, wow, these, they, look how they quote these scripture verses. And they realized, I love this verse, that they had been with Jesus. Is that what people realize when they start mixing with you? Is that what people realize about you? That you've been with Jesus? Can they see it evident in your life? How? They looked at these fisher boy, these fishermen. They're untrained. But they realize one thing about them. They've been with Jesus. Number one. When they were held on, when they grabbed them, they didn't fight back. They didn't swear like everybody else. No, they submitted. Then when they stood in front of them, they were not intimidated. And then when they opened up their mouths and spoke about Jesus, they gave the gospel. And these men went, my students is not like these two men. Where did they come from? They've been with Jesus. Let me tell you, friend, brother, sister. If you spend time with Jesus, He will rub off on you. Have you heard that phrase? He will rub off on you. If you spend time with Jesus and with the children of Jesus, with His saints, they will rub off on you. And you know what will happen? People will look at you and they go, What is in Him? What is in her? Why are they so calm? They must have been with somebody. Who? They've been with Jesus. This is what they saw about these men. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go outside of the council, they conferred amongst themselves and saying, what shall we do to these men? And that's the problem in the world today with Christians. What shall we do with these Christians? And that is going to become a bigger problem going forward in life. Persecution will come to your address. Persecution will come to your hometown. Persecution will come to your city. And then it will come straight to your home and your address. It will come to your workplace. It's already there. You see, the world and the, and the place don't want Christians. What shall we do with these men, with these people? For indeed, that a noble miracle has done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people. Listen to this now. Let us severely threaten them. Severely threaten them. That from now on, they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge that. You see, I, I love this. I love this. They didn't walk in there and say, Who do you think you are? They didn't pick a fight, did they? They deflected. They deflected. How did they deflect? They said, Whether it's right in the sight of God. To listen to you more than God, you judge that. We're not going to become part of that. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to preach the gospel. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel. You keep on fighting. You do what you want to do. I'm going to preach Jesus. No, you shouldn't do that. Yes, I'm going to do that. They were so intimidated. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And that is a message in itself. You see, so many times people come and they, they preach about things which they heard people say. If, if you come to Jesus Christ and you see personally in your life what He's done, and you talk about that, that is what people want to hear. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because the people, since they glorified God, what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old whom the miracle of healing had been performed. So that is what happened. These men were persecuted. And one can look at this and say, but why didn't God protect them? Why did God allow them to go through this testing? I mean, it's, it's His ch children, isn't it? It's His disciples, isn't it? 
They are apostles now, isn't it? Why didn't God send in an angel? Yeah, I've heard that before. Why didn't God send in an angel and stand next to them? And why didn't when they threatened them and grabbed them, the angel protected them and cotton wool around them? Why didn't God do that? You see, because that's not how God works. And this is now that I want to explain to you and I want to use that passage as this is a great example of how faith is proved. Again I say to you, you cannot prove your faith if you don't test it. You cannot prove your faith. Some of us and some of you have gone through difficult times in your lives. Difficult times. There were dark times in your life where you, you may have sat there and said, nobody's hearing me. I've lost so much. You may have prayed and prayed and prayed and it feels as if God is not listening to you. Somebody said a bad word. You got into a difficult situation. You lose your job. Something happened. And then people say, but why God? I'm your child. Don't you care for me? I mean, John, the Baptist was sitting in prison. He was the one who was proclaiming, behold the Lamb of God. And now he's sitting in prison. And even John, even him, started to doubt. He sent his disciples to Jesus and say, are you really the one? He came into a really dark place. But you see, this is the thing. All of these things happen so that your faith can be tested. How can you sit here today and you say, I've got faith, and it has never been tested? It's like somebody who builds a, a yacht. You know, you build a yacht for a long time. You build the boat itself, and then you come to the mast, and you go and you select the purest uh, a timber that you can get, and you fashion it, and you put it right up there in your boat, and then you get all of your sails out and you get the strongest uh, 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 um, ropes that you can and you put it all there and there it sits in the harbor and you bring all your friends over and you say, man, isn't she a beauty? And you've painted it beautiful, you've given it a name and now you stand there and you say, behold my ship. Isn't she beauty? And for the next 20 years you bring people around and say, isn't she beauty? But you've never taken that little ship out into the ocean. You've never felt the wind blowing against those sails, pulling on those ropes that you can hear the cracking of the ropes. You've never had that mast going into a storm where it can be tested whether it's strong or not. It just sits there. It just sits there in the harbor. But let me tell you, whether you like it or not, difficult times will come your way. There could be a day that the storm is not staying in, in the ocean, but the storm now goes towards that little harbor and it crosses the line into the harbor and all of a sudden your little ship that sits there now for the first time I've got to experience without sails even the wind and the waves that heating against it. And you know, because it's been sitting in the harbor for so long, the wood has become so rotten that even a small little wave that goes against it starts breaking the timber. And now you run to the pastor or to somebody and you say, I'm going to lose my faith. Are you with me now? Faith needs to be tested. The Bible tells us that faith is tested. These men came out, they were with Jesus all the time. All the time. They could just call on him. Jesus, couldn't you see? Look at all these waves. The boat is nearly half full. Don't you care for us? You just lie there and sleep. And what did Jesus do? He stood up and he says, Wind, calm down. Waves be dead. And there's the storm over. And you see a lot of people still wants to stay in that stage of their Christian walk. I can just rely on Jesus and he's there for you. But never ever do you come into the place where your faith is tested. Faith can't grow if it's not tested. So these men, they're there with Jesus. And then Jesus say one day to them, and He says, Look, it's, uh, I'm going to go away. Where are you going to go? You're going to go to Galilee? No, no, no. I'm going to go to a place where you can't follow me now. But eventually you will, but not right now. I'm going to die. And then He moves away. He dies. He's taken up on heaven. And here's these men on their own. And now they taste this. Their faith is tested. I'm going to give you one scripture verse and I'm going to unpack it and then we're going to pray. But 
may the Lord teach you something through the next verse. James chapter 1 verse 2. We all know this verse. I'm just going to unpack it for you. And may the Lord maybe give you some teaching in this. James says, my brethren, count it all joy. Everybody say joy. joy. What is joy? Do you understand joy? Has everybody in their lives been joyful? It's happy. It's upbeat. Count it all joy. Have you noticed he says all joy? All joy. Everything. He says count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Everybody say trials. trials. Knowing. What do we need to know now James? Knowing that the testing of your faith. There's our word faith. See? The testing of your faith produces what? Patience. But. Sharp contrast. Let patience have its Perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So James is even saying what I'm saying today. In fact, let me turn it the right way. I'm even saying what James is saying. What is that? That your faith is going to be tested. But when it is tested, count it all joy. Now let's look at that word faith there, because we know the definition for faith comes from Hebrews chapter 11. He says, now faith is the substance. Everybody say substance. Now I love this now. Of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained good testimony. The elders obtained good testimony. You can put James's name in there now. You can put Peter's name in there now. You can put John's name in there now. For today's message. But he says faith is a substance. No, it's so easy if you study the scriptures and you learn verses that you memorize the scripture verse and when I come to you, you say to me, oh, faith is a substance of things not hoped for and things not seen. But have you actually gone and soaked in the word and studied the word and understand what substance means? Have you done that? You see, because the word substance here means that something is cemented. And I, I understand this because when I was younger, my dad, I helped him one day to put in a post. A post uh, for, for a wall. And you can't just put it in, you have to cement it in. Have, have you seen that? And I was standing there as a young boy and when I studied this, that came to my re recollection. I was standing there, my dad said, hold on to the pole. And I held on to the pole and he started throwing in that liquid, that liquid cement. While it was still liquid, I could move the pole around. And my dad sometimes said, hold it still. Are you with me? Yeah? I go, yes, dad. Yes, dad. And I held it and I held it. And I go, how long, dad? Just hold it. Okay. So now what are we waiting for? We wait for the cement to sit. And then just before it started getting really firm, my dad said, okay, stand aside. And he took it and I could leave it. And then he had a plumb line. Who knows what's a plumb line? And then he held down the plumb line. And then, because it wasn't set yet, he could move it into a perfect, a perfect line. That cement, once it's set, that substance, that is set. Man, and I tried as a young boy. When it was really set, I went and I leaned against it. I tried to push it. I couldn't push it. It was set. It was right there. This is an important word to understand the scripture verse. It's, a, it's an important understanding because what that means in our world, because he's obviously not talking about cement there. You know, the, now faith is the cement of things hoped for. He's not talking about cement, but what is he talking about? He's talking about the steadfastness of mind, a firm trust. That's what faith is. You've made up your mind. Nobody can come now to you and talk you out of believing in and if they do, then that cement is still liquid. That's still liquid. You still need to grow and learn and read and soak more in the word so that it can become firm. There's so many people over my life who came and tested me on what I believe now. Where is your God? I can't see him. Well, I'm steadfast in my mind, although I don't see him. I know him. Hallelujah. Is that you? Prove me your God. I don't have to prove him to you. Look around you. Look at nature. He's, he's not nature itself, but he's the one who made nature, the creator of that. Sit fast. That's what faith is. Now, what's, what does James say? He says, when this faith, this steadfastness of your mind 
is tested. You need to count it all joy. And then he says it produces patience. So, so something happens. God is going to bring something your way. Peter and John, they were preaching there in the porch. People are responding to the message. They are joyful. They can see the word is getting into heart. It's breaking through. Then all of a sudden men came around and they grabbed them with violence. Can you see how their faith is tested? Grab them with violence. Pull them away. In your life, what is it? What is the one thing that's testing your faith today? Are you steadfast in your mind? Are you holding on to God? Because if you hold on, if you are steadfast, something's going to happen. You're going to learn patience. Now the definition for patience is the capacity to accept a delay. Is that you at McDonald's when you sit there and wait? <laughs> are you accepting the delay? Patience is to accept a delay or a problem or a suffering, listen now, without being annoyed. Or anxious. <laughs> that is patience. Help me Lord. <laughs> is there somebody shouting out. Help me Lord. I need a lot of that. How quickly do you get patience. When, uh, annoyed when you sit on the phone with Telstra. And it goes an hour ticks over. <laughs> so that's what patience is. But there's another word for patience. Endurance. Endurance is the ability to endure. Difficult process. Or things without giving up. When you think about endurance, you think about stamina, yeah? An endurance racer who runs needs to have stamina. I mean, I go to the gym and I pump iron. What do I do? I test my muscles. I break my muscles. And by doing that, next time I go, I've built up endurance. I can do a little bit longer. This is what it is. Another word I hurry is the word perseverance. It's to continue in an action even if there is no sign of success. So what is James saying? He says your faith is going to be tested. But be joyful. Why? Because you're going to grow patience. You're going to grow endurance and perseverance. All of these things. Now let me jump quickly to Romans. Romans chapter 5. You need to go and read Romans chapter 5 this afternoon. After you soaked in the scriptures. Okay? This is an extra. Paul writes this now. He says, and not only that. No, no. Let me, let me go. Let's open up in your Bibles. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. I don't want to just take the scripture verse out of context. I want to read it to you in context. Romans chapter one, 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access, access by faith into this grace. So my mind is set on that now. We have access to God. I'm set on it. In which we stand and rejoice in the hope and glory of God. And now he says, not only that, but we also glory. Is that another word for joy? We glory in what? Tribulation. Do you want to know what the word there means? Tribulation means to press. That means, and it, what you've got to have in mind is an olive Press. You put the olives in and you start pressing it. What, what happens? The olives break and the oil comes out. That's what tribulation means. You're going to get pressed from all circles in life. He says, but we glory in tribulations and tests. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. There's our word patience. Okay, so here he says, our faith produces patience. Paul says the same thing. And patience? Character. There's a process here. Character is experience. That builds your character. That's built there. And then character builds what? Hope. And hope is an expectation for a particular thing to happen. This is how your faith has been tested. Let's go back to James and let's finish up. He says, my brethren, count it all joy. Be joyful when you are falling to tests, tribulations, trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith, that steadfastness, produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work and that you may be perfect. It's interesting that he uses the same Greek word in two places in the same sentence. But it's got a different meaning. 
What does it mean? It means in the first place that it needs to come to an end. Your patience, the testing of your trials will come to an end. But it needs to come to an end that you may grow up. Everybody say grow up. So what is he saying? James is saying when your faith is going to be tested, you're going to grow. You're going to, don't complain about it. When you are tested, when difficult things come to your way, thank God for it. Why can you thank God for it? Because you're going to grow. You're going to gain patience. You're going to gain endurance, perseverance. And then what's going to come? Hope. Hope is going to come. This is what it is. Faith plus tribulation, which is your test and trials, equals patience. It gives you patience. And patience then flows into character, your experience. And, and that flows into hope. And in all of that, that is how you grow. That brings you maturity. That's what it brings. Next time when you go through the same tribulation and the same test, because you've done this before and you have this hope, you start off with a new test in your life. Your faith is stronger. You are much more firmer in that. Next time when you come to this trouble, you say, thank you Lord, I rejoice in the testing of my faith. Let it be known that nothing happens to you without the permission of God. Nothing. And it's not, I'll finish with these words, it's not as if God is sitting on the throne and he's sleeping, because the Bible says God never sleeps. Who knows that? And there you are down there, Melbourne, Karam Downs, or whichever suburb you come from, and you've already now for a whole week struggled through something. You know, it could be anything. You put it in there. And it's a test. And it tests your faith. And God sits there and goes, Oh, what's happened to my child? No. From when things happened in your life, He allowed it to happen for a reason. Why? So that your faith may be tested. Maybe there need to be corrections that you need to make. Maybe there's a lot of things that's going to do. But God is not testing you so that He can see how you're going to react. Because He already knows how you're going to react. He already knows that. No, no, He tests you because He wants you to see how you're going to react. And from that reaction, how you're going to learn to react differently next time. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank You so much this morning for Your Word. Father, we all need to learn. I need to learn again. And I thank you, Lord, even as I preach this sermon that I've heard it myself. That, Father, we need your help. Thank you for the tests that come our way, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you build our faith. Father, we don't want to be like the waves in the sea, tossed to and fro. Because the Bible says that's a double-minded man. And the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But help us, Lord, to be stable. Stand on faith with you. We've learned from Peter and John today. They went through a difficult time. But Lord, nowhere in that passage, nowhere do I see that they complain. I only see that they testify about Jesus. Help us, Lord, in our times of test, of trouble, to look upon you and to call upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.